So good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is David Harris uh, from the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute, and on behalf of Dean Minow, I want to welcome you to Harvard Law School. Uh, it's actually a, a, a peculiar thing that this could be the last time I get to say that, as uh, Dean Minow is uh, stepping aside, as many of you know. Uh, so I want to give a special thanks to her for the support she has given over the years to the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute. Uh, it's been very important to us and uh, very sustaining, and uh, we will certainly uh, miss her in that capacity, but uh, glad that she will still be with us. Uh, today is really Johanna's uh, event, and I won't linger up here, uh, but I do want to emphasize that today's conference comes at the intersection of two projects we have going, the Fair Punishment Project and the work we've been doing on community justice for many years. We're extremely excited about this new environment in which the conduct of prosecutors is receiving increased scrutiny uh, and the opportunity this attention presents for mobilizing communities subjected to the harsh and disparate punishment uh, the policies of the past have engendered. Uh, we at the Institute often speak of a maze of mass incarceration and actually think that the role of the prosecutor represents one of the most critical exits from that maze, so we're really glad to be able to be here today. Uh, those of you uh, familiar with our work and with uh, uh, my commentary know <clears throat> that I have this obsession about uh, focusing on the way we talk about things, and uh, I, I, I think I want to repeat what many of you have heard before. Uh, I, I really hope that over time we can start to eliminate the use of the term criminal justice from our vocabulary. Uh, I really find the, the term criminal to be, uh, aside from the associations it, it conjures, it's, it's really uh, uh, inappropriate and, and doesn't uh, get us where we need to go. And I'm hopeful that we can start to think about justice uh, as a goal and what that means <clears throat> and, and uh, by uh, separating it from this notion of criminality, uh, we will get a lot further. Uh, I'd also like to let you know that uh, Professor Ogletree uh, is on leave at this point and uh, uh, will, uh, has stepped aside as the uh, director, of, the faculty director of the institute. Uh, we obviously will miss his presence greatly and immensely, uh, but continue to benefit from uh, the wisdom and the passion that he brought to our work. Uh, I want you to mark your calendars on October 2nd. Uh, we will be, the law school will be hosting a symposium to honor Professor Ogletree, and we really hope that you will all be able to join us then. There are a couple more things I want to say. Uh, I want to give a shout out. Uh, last night, I, I received a voicemail uh, from someone who asked me if today's event would be appropriate for an 11-year-old. Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, you know, I, I bit my tongue from saying, you know, the 11-year-old could probably teach us a great deal. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I answered back that, that certainly uh, she would be welcome. And uh, I, I learned, because I had this correspondence late at night, that she had gone to bed uh, thinking that she wasn't going to make it because I hadn't had the uh, email, I hadn't had the voicemail and hadn't answered yet. Uh, but I want to give a shout to her because and to her dad, because uh, I did talk to him, and last night we did communicate, and uh, he was able to bring her up uh, from Connecticut, right? Uh, and even more uh, impressive uh, is the fact that she found out about this on her own, right? Uh, <laughs> so I want to introduce Alexandra Garvey. I'd like you to stand up and greet the people for me, please. You and your father, Lynn, too, right? <laughs> So I need, to, I need to put all you panelists on notice because she's sitting up here in the front row. She has a pen and paper and notes, and she will be grilling you. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I'd also like to kind of repeat a, a constant refrain. Those of you who have been to these events in the past know that I, I always give uh, extreme thanks and praise to uh, Kelly Garvin and Ernest Owens, uh, who really make these things happen for us. And, uh, uh, I, I say it again today with, with a little extra added emotion because uh, today is Ernest's last day with us. Uh, and uh, it's a very, it's, there's no better time for him to, to go out than an event like this, but Ernest, Kelly, Johanna, and I have been together for 10 years, 
And uh, this is really a significant departure. Ernest has found his, Kelly never comes, and Ernest seems to have ducked out. Uh, but I want us to make sure that we give him his appropriate praise, and I ask you to join me in giving him an extra shout out of thanks. It's, it's really, you know, it's really very difficult for us. Uh, so uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge and give thanks to, to the ACLU, uh, longtime partners of ours and co-sponsors of this event. And I think Johanna will say a little bit more, but it, it really means a lot to us to be able to call the ACLU our partners and uh, to, to be able to work as closely with them as we do. Uh, so uh, I will uh, leave it to Johanna to say a little bit more about that. Uh, now, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, Professor Tomiko Brown Nagan, uh, who it, it has stepped in and is now the faculty director of the Houston Institute. And we're really pleased to, to be able to, have, to welcome her as, as, uh, into the family. Um, I encourage you to go to the website to learn a great deal more about her. Uh, but I, I want to kind of uh, assure you that uh, she comes to this. Uh, undertaking with the same commitment to justice and equality and passion for the work that we're doing that Professor Ogletree had. And uh, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome her to give you some remarks. Professor Brandnagan. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you to Joanna for putting together this uh, wonderful event, to Kelly, to Ernest on his last day. Welcome uh, to those of you in the audience uh, to Harvard Law School. Um, I rise not only to welcome you, but to emphasize as a scholar of uh, civil rights, as an historian of civil rights, um, the importance of the struggle for ethical and fair-minded uh, prosecutors, um, the importance to the struggle, the long struggle for civil and human rights. And I'm going to uh, make that point, underscore the importance of this work by referring to some advice that um, Robert Carter, the legendary uh, civil rights lawyer um, and judge gave to me um, many years ago. I clerked for uh, Judge Carter and there was a time in my clerkship when I was worried about um, what I would do in the coming years. And I went to him uh, and I said, uh, Judge, what should I and other uh, social justice oriented lawyers do with ourselves in the future? What should we do? How can we make a contribution? Now, you might imagine that Judge Carter who had litigated Brown versus Board of Education and many other important uh, civil cases would say, well, go and join the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, right? After all, many of us uh, like to see ourselves replicated, frankly, uh, in future generations. But that is not what he said. He said to me and to my co-clerk, I'll mention him, Carter Stewart, Go and be a prosecutor, which was surprising to me to hear. But he said, go and be a prosecutor, because it's prosecutors who are determining the fates of our communities. So long before um, people started to talk about mass incarceration, this wise old man who was an icon of a civil rights movement um, understood that the themes that you're going to talk about at this conference today were absolutely vital to the struggle for racial justice, for social justice, and I think um, it speaks volumes that Judge Carter um, was thinking that way so many years ago. I salute all of you for being a part of that vital conversation, and I'm so happy to be uh, a part of the Houston Institute as it um, endeavors to contribute to um, these very important questions um, about race and equality in the context of uh, the justice system in the years to come. 
And now I want to transition uh, by introducing Carol Rose, who is the executive director of the uh, ACLU of Massachusetts. She really needs no introduction. She's a longtime friend of the Houston Institute. Welcome, Ms. Rose. Hi, thank you all. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you, uh, Professor, and thank you, uh, David, and to everyone at the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute. On behalf of the ACLU of Massachusetts, it is my pleasure uh, to be part of this uh, convening today. Um, and one of the things that I want to talk about briefly before we begin the program is bringing the theory that we're going to talk about into practice, the praxis, if you would. Um, and in particular, what we can do here in Massachusetts. Um, as many of you know, um, prosecutors have an extraordinary amount of power. Uh, There's sort of the public elected officials of whom you know nothing about, right, for, the most, uh, for most people and for most voters. Um, in fact, it's really remarkable. Um, in the last 20 years, almost 77% of the prosecutorial races here in Massachusetts have been uncontested. And yet, responding to the voters is pretty much the only level of accountability that prosecutors have in the Commonwealth. And what a difference a DA makes. Um, they have tremendous power over various things, such as uh, reforming and repealing mandatory minimum sentencing, uh, which here in Massachusetts has a huge impact, in particular a racial impact. Um, first of all, the existence of mandatory minimum sentencing is one of the reasons that some 90% of the cases end in plea arrangements. Um, of the people serving mandatory minimum sentences, while uh, people of color comprise only 25% of the population in the Commonwealth, they comprise 75% of the people serving mandatory minimum sentences here in Massachusetts. We've seen the power and the influence that prosecutors have on civil asset forfeiture, which again, here in Massachusetts, there's virtually no oversight or accountability. Uh, for the data that's most recently available from 2013 to 2016, the prosecutor seized uh, assets, cash, and property uh, worth about $12.5 million. Uh, of that, about $1 million was invested in things like you know, drug treatment, education, things like that. The rest, some $11 million, uh, went into unspecified accounts, which titles such as distribution to police. Uh, and similar aspects like that. Again, virtually no oversight or accountability but that of the voters who, for the most part, don't even know what a DA does or that they are accountable to the voters and only to the voters at this point. And finally, um, we really can't talk about prosecutorial reform in Massachusetts without talking about uh, the drug lab scandals. Uh, both the Hinton lab scandal, the, what some people refer to as the Annie Ducan, but in fact it was a much larger systemic scandal, and now uh, the Amherst drug lab scandal that's still going on still is unresolved uh, out at the Amherst lab out in western Massachusetts. I'm pleased to announce or report for those of you who haven't gotten the news that thanks to tremendous years and years of litigation by the ACLU and uh, the public defender, CPCS, uh, the Supreme Judicial Court just last month finally vacated some 23,595 tainted drug convictions coming out of the Hinton drug lab scandal. It's a wonderful, in the end, it turned out to be a wonderful cooperation uh, with the public defenders, the ACLU, and the prosecutors, but it shouldn't have taken that long, and it shouldn't have taken litigation to clean up that mess. Uh, the notion that there were court papers that actually said that the, urged the court to preserve convictions rather than preserve due process is really alarming. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to understand whether we're talking about asset forfeiture, whether we're talking about uh, drug lab scandals, whether we're talking about mandatory minimums, we need to have a system where the voters actually understand the importance of their vote and the importance of understanding what prosecutors do. And that's why today isn't just important from a theoretical point of view, it's important from a real world point of view. And this fall, um, the ACLU and a coalition of other groups, which we invite you to join, uh, is gonna be launching a voter education campaign uh, so that people understand what a difference a DA makes. And today is a wonderful place for us to begin that conversation. Uh, thank you.
It is now my pleasure to introduce to you and invite to the podium Johanna Wald, whose title is Director of Strategic Planning, uh, but as everyone knows, she's sort of the guru of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute. Johanna. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I don't think I've ever been called a guru before, so. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. It is really gratifying to, to me to see so many of you here today. I think most of you will know this is a, a project that's near and dear to my heart, this topic. And I want to um, start my thanks with the thanks to the ACLU, to Carol, and to Whitney, and to Rasan. Um, I remember 10 years ago when I first started at the Houston Institute, one of our very first meetings was with the ACLU over the School to Prison Pipeline Project. And we've been partnering with them on various projects ever since. Um, it's just been a real pleasure and privilege to work with the ACLU, and particularly on this project, because I feel like Whitney and I are kind of um, uh, uh, very... Um, passionate about this subject together. And so this has been a real collaboration as we've worked to kind of um, structure these, the day, and to think about you know, who, who these panelists might be. Um, we've really worked together, and I look forward to more collaborations with the ACLU, so I want to thank them. Um, I also just want to stop again. It really hasn't hit me that today is Ernest's last day. Um, and I, I can't even go there right now, but I want to thank so much Kelly and Ernest. We're a very small institute. There are only four of us. Kelly and Ernest literally do everything, and they do it so well and so competently and so um, without fanfare that you often don't know they're around. Um, but um, we could not exist without Kelly Garvin and Ernest Owen, so I want to reiterate what David um, said to thank them. I, also, um, I'm very grateful and want to welcome um, Professor Brown Nagan to the Institute. We're really excited about working with her. And of course, we um, honor uh, the tremendous leadership and vision of Professor Ogletree, who started this institute more than a decade ago and who spent his year, his life, you know, dedicated to issues of, of race and justice. So, with all of those things, I want to um, kind of quickly t sort of talk you through what the program is going to look like today. Um, I think many of us feel like um, this, new de this relatively new development, it's a couple of years old at this point, um, of scrutinizing much more closely the role of the prosecutor and um, of, of potentially redefining it within a different kind of criminal justice system is one of the most promising and exciting developments in the justice reform field. Um, I think the ground has shifted dramatically. It used to be that district attorney races sort of revolved around who could prove they were tougher on crime than the other person and who could show how many people they had locked up and it was more than their op opponent did. And that ground has shifted dramatically in the past just two years. Um, just to name a few people today, we have Scott Cullum, James Stewart, Kim Fox, Kim uh, Og, Beth McCann, John Chisholm, Lenise Washington, George Gasson, Cyrus Vance, and most recently Larry Krasner, um, in such places as Louisiana, Illinois, Colorado, Wisconsin, California, Florida, and Mississippi. They've all run on openly reformed platforms. They've talked about uh, reducing mass incarceration. They've talked about ending reform. Um, uh, they've talked about bail reform. They've talked about diversion for juveniles. They've talked about um, not pursuing the death penalty, and they've won their election. So the ground is definitely shifting. There's a new um, attention being paid to just exactly the power of the prosecutor, and it's a very exciting development. So we're really, really excited to have an all-star cast today, uh, a group of panelists um, who have been doing this work all across the country. Um, so I just want to quickly run you through the day so you get a sense of where your breaks are. Um, the first panel will start immediately, and it's uh, defining the new role of, of the prosecutor. And we've got um, a, a number of panelists who have been doing this work for a very long time. Then my colleague Laura McNeil and I are going to share with you some very preliminary results of, of some of the interviews we've been doing uh, with prosecutors. Um, then we're going to have a panel of former prosecutors who are going to talk about their own journeys um, and what that meant and what they see as the real opportunities for reform in the field. Um, then we uh, have two presentations, so you don't really get a break at lunch, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we will schedule one other break, but we've got two fantastic presentations, so please, uh, we will have box lunches for everyone. Uh, John Pfaff, 
um, who uh, really, I think, started, uh, he started to look at the role that the prosecutorial decision making and charging has made in the prison buildup. And his research has really been a game changer. Um, it has, uh, and he is here today. We're so excited, and he's going to be making a presentation. Um, he's just had a new book uh, out. Um, and then a new organization called Measures for, Ch for Justice, which is looking at um, uh, developing countywide measures of justice. Again, very exciting. They just launched a couple of weeks ago, and we're very delighted to have Caroline Sarnoff make a presentation there. So, and then in the afternoon, Whitney is going to take over and look at community oversight with an incredible panel of individuals who have been working, advocates on the ground, who have been working to engage communities in this work. And uh, her, her uh, panel is incredibly exciting, and that's going to move right into kind of a, a dialogue with the audience. So we're very excited about today. Um, and with that, I'm going to bring up the first panel. Thank you.